the title of my talk is uh, Beizai Singularity in the Labyrinth of Iranian Modernities. It is far from hyperbole to suggest that there has been a plethora of modernities in Iran, as there are anywhere modernity has been at hand. It has created a treacherous labyrinth for those seeking to navigate their way to a transition they deem both desirable and inevitable. In its ideal form, it is a transition to an enduring and inclusive, local and global, secular and rational society, where men and women, regardless of religion and ethnicity, are equal, where the audacity to think critically and to sustain ambiguities is cherished, where the dignity of individual artists to create free from any censorship is as sacred as the sacred beliefs they may or may not hold, a society where religion belongs to the private domain and where self-assertive individualism and the belief in the contingency of one's ideas, even one's theories, combine to create civil intellectual discourse bereft of false certainties. Creating such a society has been one of the greatest challenges of our time. In this labyrinth, at every turn, Bahram Beizai has taken the, load, the road less traveled. He has created an impressive collection of works that are singular in their daring and defiance, insight and erudition, creativity and innovation. At the same time, he has lived a life dedicated to the dignity and responsibility of the artist and the scholar, one where he has avoided the crude temptations of the market and suffered the cruel punishments of peddlers of power and ideology. Mapping out all aspects of his modernity is beyond the scope of one essay and certainly a 20-minute summary. I will thus focus on only aspect of his singularity with particular emphasis on his 10 years at Stanford and what his prolific and productive work here tells us about his path out of this labyrinth. Modernity is about individualism, and thus we should begin with Bezoi's notion of the artist as an individual. The intellectual, as a citizen of a new republic of letters, someone whose vocation and avocation is the realm of arts and ideas, someone whose critical disposition towards the status quo is part of her or his identity, has been in Iran, as elsewhere, a child of modernity. But for all too many Iranian intellectuals, the concept has become an odd mixture of the old religious messiah and the new revolutionary vanguard. Someone perched on a Promethean mountain with a self-declared role to lead and save the masses. An incumbent part of this self-asserted role has been a sense of entitlement in what the masses owe these intellectuals. Moreover, this leading role has too often devolved into merely pandering to the winds of popular whims or dogmas of secular or religious parties or power. Beizai has been as defiantly critical of the false pieties of these intellectuals as he has been of the ingrained or whimsical prejudices of the masses. For him, being an artist, a scholar, and a teacher begets not a sense of entitlement, but more than anything else, a set of responsibilities. The responsibility to avoid facile slogans and sermons to study exhaustively and speak judiciously. He not only avoids the pontifications of religious or secular pre preachers and peddlers of dogma, but invariably engages his interlocutors, whether a student in his class, a reader of his text, or an audience of his films or plays. He engages them to think critically and independently, to doubt everything but doubt itself, 
to believe in no Messiah but the liberating power of their own critical rationalism. In all the years I've had the pleasure of working with him at Stanford, I have never seen or heard him offer views on a subject he had not mastered through erudite inquiry. While personalities like Al Ahmad and Shariati cultivated the tradition of talking more than reading, and as a consequence, any closest scrutiny of virtually every one of their works invariably exposes great lacuna of knowledge. The case of Bezai is the opposite. His knowledge of any subject he writes about or talks about is encyclopedic. His attention to the minutiae of a scholarship exhaustive, and his respect for his audience impressive, a respect shown by his obsessive preparation for every work, by the caution he shows in every utterance, and by the diligence he expects of his interlocutors to find the word within the word. In fashioning for himself this kind of a persona and personality, and in him the pipe public and the private are delightfully alike, he has created a different model of how to be at once an artist and scholar of the arts and a teacher. This notion of the self and of the artist and of the scholar stands in sharp contrast to the convoluted dominant Iranian discourse of what modern so-called committed art and political aesthetics entails, a discourse that mixes elements of Stalin's Jadanov with Francis uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and adds sh uh, elements of Shiism's cult of martyrs and messiahs. Bezoi has often been chastised and more than once put on trial for being apolitical. He is, in my view, however, in virtually everything he has written, one of the most astutely political artists of our time. He is averse to bombast, and bombast is often the only coin of the realm for the committed so-called political art. His commitment is to his art, not to his ideology, and his notion of politics is modern and democratic, not traditional and elitist. For him, art is not an instrument of politics, but the politics of his texts grow organically from their fiber, one that carefully and critically reflects social reality. Modernity shifts the focus of the political gaze from the top of the social pyramid to its base, from the top of the hierarchy of power to the granular level of individual lives and social habits of the quotidian. It invariably ex eclipses the messianism that seeks salvation in a mythic hero, an occulted saint, or a proletarian party. It posits an end to the period of waiting for celestial redemption that will shape history's supposed repetitious uh, cycle. Instead, he seeks freedom from the nightmare that is history's alleged circularity. He argues that only uh, in our own individual and joint efforts, and in our recognition that as individuals we can be the masters of our fortune, can we find a way out of this labyrinth. Like Shakespeare, Bezoi often declares that it is not in our stars, but in our actions and inactions that we are thus and so. And it is in these choices that we make where we shape the enigma Machiavelli famously called Fortuna. Each of the plays he has staged at Stanford, every workshop he has conducted here, are examples of a style that is aesthetically refined, politically democratic, and relentlessly modern. From his Arash and its brilliant deconstruction of the alienating and debilitating habit of hero worship, to the laments of the poet in Tarab Nomeh, who challenges to heed the call of our conscience and hear the voice of a creative artist. From the self-assertive woman at the center of Crossroad to Bezoe's poetic and novel creation myth offered in John of Baladur, 
thinking individuals and defined subjectivities as likely to be women as men are seeking a way out of this labyrinth. The ribald and the rebellious, the comic and the tragic are seamlessly woven, woven into this fabric of the same scene and sentence. In this uniquely political perspective, there are for Bezoi, as for any trailblazing artist, no sacred boundaries. In Aida Viroff, he dares us to doubt our received opinions about saints and sinners, heroes and villains. He reminds us that these characters, too, are made of the gray metal of humanity, full of frailties and virtues. Like Gilgamesh before him, in Aida Viroff, humans and their curiosities, not sacred texts and their dictates, afford us a glance into the other world. In this, as in his many other plays, Bezoi adopts, reimagines, and protects what is useful and often ignored in our past, and uncovers, criticizes, and rejects the often ignored, obsolete, or unsavory elements of our history. He has what in the German tradition of philosophy has been called an inclusively dialectical approach to this past. In other words, he is protective of the useful fragments and critical of intellectuals who think ignorance of this past is a bliss, attributing all innovations to the West is modern, or glossing over our failings is a patriotic duty. If he praises Shahnameh, it is not because he subscribes to the view that Iran, and only Iran, has been the font of all art and virtue. He praises Shahnameh because he has read it diligently, has paid attention to its formal tropes and intellectual terms, has cherished its ability to create drama and dialogue, develop characters and plot. Maybe he also likes Ferdowsi because, unlike the misogyny of his age, Ferdowsi found his muse in an erudite woman of Epicurean sensibilities. The remarkable place of woman in almost every one of Bezai's plays and films is yet another critical aspect of his modernity. In this sense, one could read his Cherikeya Tara as his rendition of parts of Shahnameh. Hans Blumenberg has argued that much of literature is nothing but work on myth, each epoch or culture reworking old myth and archetypes. For Bezai, Shahnameh is an encyclopedia of these myths, a treasure trove of what our modernism and modernity could adopt. Another remarkable af aspect of his search in this labyrinth has been his rejection of Eurocentric views of modernity. For generations of Iranian artists and intellectuals, the font of all that was modern was deemed to be the West. Bezoi has sought, reimagined, and reinvented all that is useful in the Iranian tradition for his modernism. From the often dismissed tradition of takht e he shaped a brilliant tarabname that is as much a social history of mirth and merriment as a critical story of their despotic foes. In Janova Baladur, he revived an old, forgotten, and suppressed tradition of shadow plays. But he used it to tell a brilliant story of creation that stands in sharp contrast to the stories proffered by enemies of shadow play in Iran. In all he creates, he is as curious about Eastern sources to complement his art as about artists and traditions from the West. The theater of the No and Kurosawa, no less than Hitchcock and Bresson, are subject of his avid and contagious curiosity. He has shattered the false binaries between East and West, tradition and modernity, and has sought to create works that are uniquely his own, unmistakably Iranian, but richly informed by Western and Eastern traditions, and thus remarkably global. An impressive aspect of this global and local curiosity is the depth of its erudition and scholarship 
on each subject or form he works on. His book in, on the history of Iranian theater is still, after 50 years, the most authoritative source on the subject. When he revived the tradition of shadow plays at Stanford, he also conducted a master class in the textual sources of this once popular tradition. It is also another aspect of his life and his endearing humility that when after several years someone else staged some version of a shadow play and claimed with much fanfare that it was the first revival of this form, Bezai chose silence rather than the option of writing about the history of his work at Stanford. He knows all too well that history and not chutzpah is the ultimate arbiter between innovation and kitsch. Finally, another unique aspect of Bezai's modernity is his language. Much has been written about the significance of language in modernity, the evolution of a national language, the gradual emergence of a language more indebted to Oakham's razor than to the convoluted language of medieval text, and finally, the acceptance of a vernacular as the legitimate discourse for literary text. They have all been said to be part of modernity's linguistic turn. Bezoi's language has often rightly been praised for its pith and parsimony, its precision and poetry. There is often polyphony in his plays and films, yet another hallmark of modern works of art. But in his films and plays, he has also established organically and meticulously a mutually reflective poetic and parsimonious harmony between image, gesture, and words. There is a beguiling simplicity and apparent minimalism to his creations. His plays, like Saadi's prose, are simple but impossible to imitate. Sahl wa Mamtane. Like the films of Bresson, where actors are said to be instruments of the intricate grand design of the director, in Bezaïs and films too, Every small gesture of every actor's hand, every nuance in the tone of her utterance, every ray of light or dark, uh, are like movements of a ballerina, part of a thoughtful choreography he has imagined and arranged. His actors' gestures are as codable as the words they use, thus creating what Walter Benjamin has famously called the true essence of modern epic. Bahram Bezoi is an icon because he is iconoclast. May his productive work at Stanford and his singular accomplishments as an artist long continue.